Uh, take a look up on the screen. Um, I, I guarantee you this was not, this was probably th the most difficult feeding we've done, and we don't think we're done yet. We've got uh, corn flour left over, and so we are contemplating going ahead and uh, maybe su supplying some beans along with that and some salt. That's what we're giving people. We're giving them oil to cook with, corn flour, um, and some beans and some salt. Uh, this time around, and all of this stuff was hard to come by. And when it comes to the corn flour, we have to order it. Uh, and it has to be ground. So we have to put in an order ahead of time. Uh, the supplies are limited out there. And um, I posted a lot of these pictures on Facebook last night. But if you've not seen them, uh, it, it will touch your heart. And if it doesn't, change your heart. Um, we had we sent guys out in waves on motorcycles. We hired these guys to go out and deliver uh, to each individual home, since the government is not allowing them to uh, to gather. And I want to say this too: the churches in Samburu and Turkana that support us. In other words, they listen. They love our ministry. Uh, the pastors that, uh, in some cases, we did a training session with some of them in Turkana. I've ministered in Samburu. And um, they're not able to have church. And God has laid them on my heart. And uh, I want to be careful because, there, you know, we have a lot of people listening. We have people on... In, in the Turkana area, in the Samburu area, that are listening right now. And I want to be careful with what I say, but God's laid it on my heart uh, to help these churches. Okay? Now, we have enemies out there that don't like us. Um, I'm hoping to change their mind, because I'm not going, not going away anytime soon. As long as God continues to bless that, we're going to keep doing it. Um, but it's been heavy on my heart that um, those pastors and those people are doing without. So help us pray about that, will you? Can I hear you say amen? amen. Uh, so we went to individual homes and... Some of the people that you're going to see in these pictures, they're not laying down because they're lazy. They're laying down because they're lame. Had we had a feeding where we invited people to come, these particular people would have been left out. So I think it, God was in it that he just put it, on, put it on our heart to go to each individual home. These are not tool sheds that these people are standing by. It's their house. When I say these people have nothing, they have nothing. Uh, this poor lady, she has a cup and a stick, a pair of shoes. That's about it. This man, lame, would have been forsaken had we gathered everybody together to feed them. Those people are precious to our Savior. Some of these ladies are very young. But that's their house. That's what they live in. This man here in the middle, that's where he lives. That's where he is. And Jesus died for every one of them. The 
The lady in the middle, I love her hat. The young lady that you see on the right, her shirt says, Tough Girls Rule the World. And I suppose that living out there, you would have to be tough. Some of these young ladies, probably barely out of their teens, if that. When you look upon these faces, hopefully you'll pray that Every one of these that we look upon today, we get to see in heaven one of these days. Amen? Uh, the rest of the pictures you uh, be able to see on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, I posted them on my page. I posted them in the Bethel group there. And um, we're, not, we're not done. We're not done out there. Uh, there's still a work. There's still people that are hungry, and as long as there are people that are hungry, and as long as God provides the means, then it would be wrong for us to not do what we can do. Amen. And I, wouldn't, I would not want to bear that shame. Amen? Um, there's, a, there's a reward in heaven. I don't believe that Somebody here is going to get a bigger reward than somebody else. I don't believe that. I think heaven is heaven. Amen? Um, and I think the people that live without the things that we live with here in this country, I do think they will be far blessed in the life to come. Amen? So let's, let's pray right now. For the people of Turkana, Samburu. Um, we pray that God will always allow us to do as much as we can for those people out there. And I want to say to everybody that's pitched in and helped out, uh, either with prayers or finances, may the Lord bless you. Those of you who didn't do anything, don't you dare take the credit for it. Ask God what you can do. Remember what John Kennedy said? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I'm going to say, ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for the church of Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you. And I love, I love you. Father, you've, made me a free man. And I love what you've done in my life. And I serve you, Father, out of a willing heart. And I want to serve you for the rest of my life, and then I want to serve your kingdom forever. And Father, I didn't choose to be born in America or not choose to not be born in Africa. None of us did. Where we were born, what we grew up with, and what we have now was your choice and your grace. And Lord, I, I understand that because sin is in this world, that there are always going to be those who have nothing. There's always going to be the poor. There's always going to be the needy. There's always going to be people who suffer and lack and have nothing in this life. And Father, your commandment to us is fulfilled in that we love our neighbor as ourself. And that we do unto others as we would have them do Unto us, if the roles were reversed and we were living in a hut in Turkana and we're starving and we cried because our children had nothing to eat, 
we would be glad if somebody who had something would help us who have nothing. And Father, these people didn't choose to be born where they were. They didn't choose to be born in a desert. So Father, we just, our hearts are lifted up. And we pray, dear God, that you would bless those. And Father, we're not asking to be enriched because we gave a little. All we're asking, Father, is that you use us to bless those who don't have. And that one of these days, because of our love for you and our love for them, because you love them enough to send your son to die for them, we have not sacrificed as much. Father, all we ask, God, is that you bless us so that we can be a blessing then to others and fulfill your royal law. So, Father, we pray, Lord, for the people that through our love for them, they would listen to the gospel and they would be saved. And then they can have, Father, though they are the poorest people on the earth, they have a mansion in heaven awaiting them. Help us, dear God, to not only feed their bodies, but to feed their souls. So, Father, we ask your blessings on your work and your labor, and we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. I like 150, and I don't even know what it is. Now I know what it is. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Ushers, come forward at the end of this one. Sing to God's praise this morning.
I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of this love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I would flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. When you pray this morning, pray that John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, doesn't act stupid anymore. Because the court case ended up before the Supreme Court about the rights of church people to be able to go to church. And he sided with the liberals against the Second Amendment. Or the, what minimum is First Amendment? And yet, thugs can roam the streets at night, burn everything down, and that's not nothing said and done about it. Well, I won't say nothing. They've arrested, what, about 1,400 people so far? And in Minneapolis, the police said none of the people that we were arrested were from Minneapolis. They were shipped in to start trouble. They are terrorists. And they should be treated as such. Enemies of America, I say. Amen? Uh, one guy, he was a, a black protester. And he sent out a tweeted out a video. Somebody had set a pallet of blocks in front of a government building. And he said, there ain't no construction going on around here. Somebody brought this over here and set it here for people to throw in that building. We have traitors in this country, and one of them's running for president. You figure out which, okay? Um, we have a lot to pray about and a lot to be thankful for. Amen. Amen? So let's do so this morning. Father, we do love you. And Father, there are people in this country who don't have real problems. They have make-believe problems. They invent things to be angry about. And yet when we look at the plight of the people that we just saw in Kenya, they have real problems. They don't know, Father, where their next meal is going to come from. And they don't have a choice but to rely upon you. Father, we used to know what that was like in this country. And we've gotten far away from that. So, Father, teach us, God, the only way you know how. Teach us, Father, to rely upon you. And then, as our forefathers were, be thankful for even the little that they had to be thankful in all things. Father, help us to be thankful. Help us, dear God, to give you praise no matter what. Help us, dear God, to lift up our eyes and our hearts toward heaven. And sing your praises and glorify your name. Lord, even on our darkest days. And some, Lord, are going through that right now. So God, would you cause us all to lift our hearts toward heaven. 
And even as Job, in his darkest hour, that he would not curse God, but give him praise. Amen. Father, we thank you for that kind of spirit. We thank you, Lord, for heroes like that in our Bibles. People that we can model our lives after. People that have been through, Lord, suffering that maybe some are going through now. God, that you would teach us all the lessons how to live in this world. How to endure the hardness. How to endure even slavery. Father, you don't condone it, but you will teach us how to live under it. So, Father, teach us your ways and your, and your will. We glorify you always and thank you for what we have. And, Father, we honor you, Lord, with what we give. We love you and we love your kingdom. We love your service. We pray this blessing now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. On a faraway strand Tis the beautiful soul of the soul Built by Jesus on high Where we never shall die Tis a land where we'll never grow Never grow old, never grow old in a land where we'll never grow. Old. Never grow, old, never grow old in a land where we'll never grow. All of God's people said. The battle in this country is not white against black. It's not Hispanic against white or black. It's not one race against another. It's right versus wrong. Amen. There are some things that are right, some things that are wrong. And you can be white and be wrong. So it doesn't matter what race, what color, what background, right is right and wrong is wrong, and that's the battle that we face in this country. It's because we've gotten away from the Bible. We've gotten away from it first in our homes. We've gotten away, we've gotten away from the Scriptures even in the house of God. We got away from the Bible in our schools got away from the Bible and the Ten Commandments in our judicial halls, our legislative halls, in our executive halls, we've gotten away from the Word of God. People no longer fear the Lord. They no longer care. They've been taught humanism, that man is his own God. I even heard a city councilman, there was a, some sort of council meeting. They had them all meeting from their homes because it's bad when people get in the same room together. And one guy was talking, he was on a city council somewhere, and he's talking about we need to honor the divine in all men. Excuse me? Our problem is that we think we are God, and we're not. And we've forgotten God. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Somebody say amen. Righteousness exalteth the nation. And we need to get back to that. We need our judges to quit acting stupid. Amen? And our governors to quit acting like tyrants. And our people to bear the responsibility that freedom brings. And if people think that freedom and liberty is a license to sin and to do evil then on that day that we think that, then we don't deserve liberty or freedom. That's what our forefathers believed. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what I believe. Now, I'm done with the lecture. Now I get to the message. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate folks coming. I think people are kind of slowly getting used to getting back to a normal life. 
But I am firm in the commitment that I don't care what else happens. I think we ought to have church. I think we ought to have church. I had a, a pastor call me, and um, I, I won't say who it was, but he, he asked me, he said, we haven't had, really, we haven't had services. He said, should we have church? And I said, listen, I said, I'm not your judge, and I won't judge you. We left it up to the people. We were out two Sundays. It was just me and a couple guys here. And then after that, we started opening up. Some didn't want to come back at, at first. And I understand that. Not, not saying anything's wrong with that at all. But slowly but surely, people started coming back. They realized that even if we get sick, we still need the house of God. And um, so I said, we know the liberal churches are going to use this as an excuse. I said, but God's people who have the truth, there's not a law in this country that can forbid us from meeting and coming into the house of God. Now, I heard an interview with the liberal Democrat Gretchen uh, Hitler Wilson. And one of the men who was in the legislature, one of their representatives who was a medical doctor, was given reasons why we need to open the businesses back up and we need to open the churches back up. And then, of course, now this is the governor, the chief executive of the state. You know what the executive does? Executes the laws of the land. She said, they were asking her why should not the businesses be opened up and the people allowed to go to church? She said, the science supports my decision. The law doesn't. Amen? Amen. There's not a law that says we cannot come into the house of God. For now. We don't want a scene or a situation in this country where there would be a law. That would keep us from coming to the house of God. Amen? Now, 1 Corinthians 13. God's laid this on my heart. Um, let's, let's, tell you what, let's do this. When Ezra stood with the book in his hand behind a pulpit of wood, everybody stood as he read. I don't do that all the time because I put a lot of scripture and I don't want you to have to stand every time I read scripture. But would you stand this morning with your Bible as we give reverence to the word of God? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Somebody say amen. amen. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, I want you to think about what he's saying. Let me just say this. As I get older, it's my birthday yesterday. As I get older, my mind doesn't work as well as it used to. Amen? And at some point, I'm not going to be sharp as a tack. I'm going to be dull. 
as a rock. Knowledge does pass away. But you can always love somebody. Amen? For we know in part... We prophesy in part, but that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. Say this last part with me out loud. But the greatest of these is charity. Father, I don't know how to preach this. I don't know how to say it. I don't know, Father, what you have in mind or what you have in store for these people. And I pray, dear God, that you would give it, that you would grant it, that you would rise and give us bread, food for thought, and change of our heart. Father, we love right things. We love righteousness. We love and, and are zealous for the laws of our land, for the laws that are in our Bibles. We're zealous for the fact that we believe the Word of God and the Word of God's never wrong. We seek to prove that in everything that we say and do in life. But Father, all of that is worthless if we forget to love people, if we forget to care about them. Father, I can be right on everything that I say, but if I don't love people, then I'm no good to them or you. So Father, continue, please, to work with me Judgment begins with me. And I cannot command, beg, mandate that anybody loves anybody else if I myself don't do it. I have no right to be here. I have no right to say anything. So help me to love people and love even my enemies. The people that have harmed me, done harm to me, done harm to my family. The people, Father, that I find it difficult to forgive. The people that I'm angry with. The people who would try to destroy me in this church. Teach me to love them. It is a commandment that's worth fulfilling. And I don't know how to do it. So I ask for your help. As we all do. Teach us how to love people the right way. We'll honor you and we'll praise you with that love. We'll rejoice in it. For charity covereth a multitude of sins. Cover ours, we pray. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Um, very quickly, I want to get through this part, and then I'm going to ask you a question here in a minute. I want you to think of something in the Bible, a story, that you feel promotes the idea of charity. Now, if you look that word up, um, here, here's what charity is not. True charity is not giving something to a charity. If you put clothes up in this barn up here, that's not true charity. And Paul said that. Though I give all my goods, I mean bestow all my goods to the poor and have not charity. You can give to charity, but not have charity. So that's not what it is. Okay? And let me read this. There are types, different types of love taught to us in the Bible. When someone says, oh, I love her. I had, a, I had a couple, a family that came to me years ago. 
They attended church here for a while and they dropped out. But then they had a situation come up where they had a teenage boy, 16 years old, that had a girlfriend that was 19 years old. They let the girlfriend move in and was shacking up with their 16-year-old son in their house. Gary, they brought him to me to marry. And I said, let me talk to, uh, let me talk to the kids for a minute. Had mom and dad step outside. So I asked them the question. I asked, I asked the young man the question. I said, you guys, obviously, you're committing fornication. So let me ask you the question. Why are you doing this? And he said, it's because I love her. And she said, it's because I love him. And I said, you both are wrong and you're both liars. Well, that's not what they wanted to hear. And I said, you're not cohabitating with her because you love her. You love you. You love what you're getting from her. So this is not, don't give me this nonsense about you're doing this to her because you love her. You love you first. It's when you can love her and not do this, that's when you can show that you really love her. And that kind of silenced. And I finally told him, I said, let me tell you, I'm, I've been around the block a few times. I've had this situation come up before where people, I had a young couple that came to me, wanted me to marry them. I said, what, what about your parents? Well, they don't want us to get married. I said, don't ask me to do it. Because I ain't doing it. And I told that family, I said, let me tell you what you're doing. You're asking me to make this what's going on, which is illegal. You're asking me to make it legal and justify it, and I won't do it. I turned them away. That's not love. Proverbs 7 10, look at your Bible. Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Do harlots love the men that they service? No. No, no, no. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she, with that, you know who this woman is? She's married. She's married. Life, she said, thou without in the streets and in life and wait in every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. You know what she's saying? I performed a religious duty that will allow me to fornicate. I went to the priest, paid him money. He absolved me already. I can do whatever I want. Believe it or not, there's people that believe that way. Somebody say amen. I've decked my bed with coverings and tapestry of carved works and fine linen of Egypt. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of, look at the word she uses, love. Until the morning, let us solace ourselves with loves. Is that really love? That's not love. That's the kind of love that demands something reciprocal. In other words, I will give you as long as I get back something. And that ain't love. It ain't love. Romans 12, there's several examples of this in the Bible. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, honor preferring one another. The word, that's the Greek word philos, that's where we get the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia, adelphon means brother. Philos is a type of love. It is brotherly love. It is the love that we would have for somebody if we're walking in Walmart and they tripped in front of us and we helped them pick their stuff up. That's kind of brotherly love. That's having a, a common generosity. Kind, Paul said kindly affectioned one to another. Well, we'd open the door. You guys open the door for people coming in the church. Maybe you might hold the umbrella for them, walk them out to the car. That's, that's kind of brotherly love. And let me tell you something. Even lost people can do that for one another. Can they not? So, what is charity? 
Somebody define that, describe it back to me. The, the King James now is the only one that will use this word. Even the New King James, they've upgraded it and just said love. But it does not identify the type of love that it really is. Gary. Unconditional. Doesn't matter what they do. Doesn't matter what they say. You're going to love them. Who's got another one? What is charity? We've already eliminated the fact it's not just giving something, whether it's money or items. And by the way, if you put stuff in this barn up here, it ain't because you felt bad for poor people. It's because you wanted to get rid of your junk. Get it out of my house. I'm going to put it in here. That way I don't have to deal with it no more. What is charity? Yes. Yeah. Right. That's a good way of putting it. Sharing with others what you need. Now give me an example of it in the Bible. Give me a story in the Bible. Tell me something where somebody exhibited true charity, which is the highest form of love. Here's, here's what Jesus said. Greater love hath no man than a man lay down his life for his friend. It's Christ. It's what he did. Somebody give me another story out of the Bible. Josiah. Huh? The Good Samaritan. He was a Samaritan who was despised by the full-blooded Jews because they were half-breeds. Typically, half-breeds in this world have not been treated very well. Typically, they have not. So here's a half-breed Jew who is hated by the true Jews, the true-blooded Jews. So here's this, here's this wounded Jew that not even a Levite priest would stop and help him. That was his own people. Wouldn't even do it. So here's a half-breed Jew, comes by, sees a man, he's been robbed, and he's been injured, nearly dead. He bound this man up, pouring oil and wine in his wounds. The wine, of course, was the alcohol, killing the germs, disinfecting it, binding up the wounds, taking him to a house, paying the man and said, here, i got to continue my journey. Take care of this man. Here's some money for you. G get what he needs. And when I come back by to check on him, if he ha has any more bill, I will pay it. What is the Samaritan getting out of doing this for this man? Not one thing. He does not want his picture in the paper. He does not want a reward for this. He does not want a medal. He did it. Because he had compassion and love for this man, doing what it took for this man, doing what he would want somebody to do for him. Put yourself in the other shit. Put yourself. Let me go back. Put yourself in this hut. Those of you that got a three and four bedroom house with two and a half baths. Wall to wall carpet. Those of you who have a savings account. Those of you who have money. Put yourself in this house for a week. With no opportunity, no prospect, no government aid. You would want somebody to love you enough to make sure that you lived through the week. And then when you respond to that without demanding something in return, that's charity. Now, what if all these people were just raw bone lazy and didn't do anything to deserve the food? 
First of all, does the Bible have anything to say about people who won't work? Yep. But does that mean that we shouldn't give them something? No. No. Not even the people that we would look at and say, well, they don't deserve the help. Listen, I'm like that. Hey, let them starve. They won't get up and work. Let them starve. I'm like that. But is it wrong for me to give them something? And why would I? Just because of love. You have to ask yourself the question, everything that you have, do you really deserve it? And if you, now, I'm not asking you to compare yourself with any other man or woman in this world. What I'm asking yourself is to compare yourself with God. Do you deserve what you have with what you've done in life? The answer is no. The answer is no. Somebody give me another example. There's loads of them in the scriptures. Joseph. His brothers were going to kill him. So they did worse to him. I would rather die than be sold into slavery. I mean, are we not the live free or die people? So they, they did not kill him. They did worse to him. They sold him into the hands of merchants, into slavery. And yet, when his brethren came before him, what did Joseph do? He fed them. Why did he do it? He loved them. And let me tell you something. When God puts it in your heart to love somebody, you can't stop it. Amen. You can't stop it. You can't explain it. It's just something you have to do. Shallow is the life of someone who doesn't have compassion even on his enemies. Shallow is that life. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Turn your Bibles. What is a pure heart? What is a pure heart? A pure heart is someone who does not beguile others with false charity. We probably all know somebody that whenever they extend a hand to us and do something to try to help us, we know for a fact that there is a string attached to it. We all know somebody like that, right? So whenever they do something, we know what's he up to. Hey, neighbor, I picked up your trash. The dogs that got into it. I picked up your trash last Sunday. I picked it. Did you hear what I said? I picked up your trash last Sunday. Did you hear what I said? What that means, because you know him, what that means is, I guarantee you, he's fixing to bark at me about something that I, he thinks I should have done that I didn't do. It's always somebody like that. But God forbid that it ever be any of us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that Bible's right. God, we, no man has seen God at any time. But those who are pure in heart, those who give without wanting something in return, only God knows that heart. I mean, I've heard stories of people, and I've known people, 
who would they give something in the church? I guarantee you they're going to use that as leverage inside that church to get something out of it that they want out of it. They will use it against their preachers. I give such and such. I donate such and such. Me and my family, we give so much to this church. I've had people tell me that who have donated to this church. I've had people tell me, don't you know how much I give? And yet you said something that I didn't like. And what they mean by that is, we want you to not say that anymore. And I, what I told them back was, take your money back. Because I don't want it. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. What does he mean by that? We've only been given two laws to live by. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's it. That's only two things we were told to do. Is love your neighbor as yourself. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And if you're giving and don't have love with it, keep it. Keep it. Because God don't want it, and I don't either. And of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. Which means that you give, and you give secretly. You don't want your name attached to it. You know, there's some people that give to this church. We are required by law, if it's over, what, $200? Obama did this to us. We have to start mailing out a receipt for that, showing that they gave over $200 as a charity to, to this place. We have to send that back to them. By law, we'll get in trouble if we don't. And some people get mad and they say, quit sending us those things. We don't want them because we're not going to take it off our taxes. Now, my opinion is, if Uncle Sam said, I don't deserve it or I don't need it or I can't have it, I'm not giving it to him. Amen. So if you give me the chance to reduce my taxes, I'm taking it. But that's not why I give. By the way, I don't say this, but I pay tithes too. Same church. I mean, I get paid by the tithes, but I give it back. I don't do that because I want something out of it. I don't do that because I want a reward. I do it because I love God and I love His kingdom. And that's the only time I think I've ever said that. 20 some odd years I've been here. You ought to give secretly. You ought to give quietly. And once you let it go out of your hand, who does it belong to after that? It never belongs to you. It's not yours. And from that point, it never will be. And if you're willing to let that go and let God deal with what is done with it, then you got a clean conscience, don't you? That's what he's saying here. Look what he's saying. Of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, neither where they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for homongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be anything other that is contrary to sound doctrine. All these things that the law says, don't do, don't do, don't do, they are fulfilled in one thing. Love your neighbor the way you would want them and treat your neighbor the way you want them to treat you. And that includes your enemies. And I'm preaching to Mike Hoggard first. Because I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with it. Once somebody does me wrong, I'm not interested in carrying on a relationship with them. I mean, that's just me. And I have to learn how to get over that. And it takes a long time. The day that Lisa had her surgery, somebody, a family that used to go to this church that left angry and did us great harm. His wife had surgery the same day Lisa had surgery. In fact, her surgery was right before Lisa's. So I had to see them. And I had to forget about the bitterness, the hurt, the anger. Because his wife went through what my wife went through. And I don't want anybody to go through that. And it wasn't easy. I 
So I had to pray for them and pray for me. I want a, I want a clean heart before God. I want a clean conscience. Now, this is probably going to be the le- what I this problem probably, probably going to end here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. Yeah, that's good stuff there. Now, I don't see it in my notes, but if you hold, once you get to 1 Corinthians 8, you kind of stick your hand in there and go to Proverbs 10. I got up, woke up early this morning, so I went, sat down in the living room and pulled my phone out look, to look at my Bible app where I was going to read a little bit of Bible, and it gives a verse of the day. The verse that it had up there today was Proverbs 10, 12. And I want you to look at this. I want you to think about what's going on in our country right now. Proverbs 10, 12. This Bible's right, is it not? Do, you, do we not believe that God's wiser than us? Do we not believe that we're wrong in 90% of what we do and how we think? But God's never wrong? So Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirreth up strife. Tell me if that is not exactly what's going on right now in this world. Amen. You see, they're laying blame because a white cop killed a black man. And it was wrong. It was wrong. That man was wrong in what he did. But that doesn't mean that every white person hates every black person. So what this has turned into is, this is now white against black. Because white people hate all black people, so we're going to hate all the white people. And that ain't right. That ought to be preached in every white church, black church, brown church, yellow church, red church, in this country. Ought to be preached. A soft answer turneth away wrath. What they don't understand is that they think through their force of violence that they will change everybody's heart now. It doesn't work that way. They're wrong. And do I think that just because I said it today that the whole country's going to turn around? No. I'm be starting to become like Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told, Ezekiel, go preach to them, they're your your own own people, and they speak your language. I don't think they're going to listen to you, though, but preach to them anyway. Because no matter what I preach, no matter what I say, no, no matter what I put on the internet, there's always idiots out there that won't listen. And it would be my pride... To demand and think that everybody had to. Because I used to think that way. So Proverbs 10. Yeah, verse 12. Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. Now hold that in your mind. Love covereth all sins. Now look back at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now as touching things offered up in idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. So you know what? You know what? You know what Facebook is good for? Puffed up knowledge. Because no matter what you say on Facebook, somebody is going to call you out being wrong. And when you argue back with them, they're going to keep. They're going to be. There's be a long line of comments of you and you arguing with some idiot. Who is not going to let you have the last word no matter what. I got a dog like that. I got a dog. She's nervous and old. She barks at everything. And I run in the kitchen. Layla, shut up. And she'll go. I said, shut up. I mean, every time she does it, she got to get the last word in. She's a dog. And you got people on Facebook, you got people in life that have always got to have the last word. You know what that is? That's knowledge puffed up. And it does nobody any good. Let me, let me show you something. Let me show you what that looks like. There's a word for that. I forgot the word. 
I looked it up. It's when an animal, you see that, see that monkey there? See that chimpanzee? See how his hair is sticking out? What's he doing? Making himself look bigger. Like a cat. That's why a cat does that. I'm big! And that's you, listen to me now, that's you arguing with everybody. That's you always having to get the last word. You know what that is, really? It is a big bowl of Rice Krispies. You ever ate a big bowl of Rice Krispies? I mean, big one. If you take a big bowl of Rice Krispies and crunch it all down, you've got maybe a biscuit. Maybe a biscuit, if you're lucky. It's puffed up, and you eat that in the morning, and by 10.30, you are starving to death and shaking because your blood sugar's dropped. Right? That's, that's the kind of good that you are when your knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puff up, but charity edifieth. And if a man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So there's the, the, the two witnesses right there. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 13, they're both saying exactly the same thing. If you will love people, you will not always try to win every argument in fact if you really love them you won't argue with them even in a marriage even in a marriage somebody is always got to try to be the last one and I'm going to be right and I'm not going to shut up until I get the last word. And then what have you done? Ask yourself, what have you accomplished now in your relationship with your spouse? What you've done is you've created a division. You've not created a bond. Am I right? Yeah, but he's stupid. Let God fix him. But he's wrong. She's wrong. Don't care. Create a bond. And the only thing that does that is charity. Charity. Well, I'll love on him if he'll fix the bathroom. Love on him anyway. Love on her anyway. Well, if she'll treat me right, I'd say I love you every now and then. Tell you you love her anyway. Let me tell you the story you missed. You missed the one about Jesus loving his bride unconditionally. Everybody look up here at me for a minute. Now, I want you to look at me and then I want you to think of the worst thing you did in the last two weeks. Don't tell me. Oh, you can tell me. No, don't. Don't tell me. Worst thing you did in the last two weeks. Was it bad? I don't see anybody going, mm hmm Was it bad? So why are you mad at somebody else for what they did? Did you not do something wrong? Did you not sin? Did you not violate God's commandments? So who are you to be upset with somebody else's sins? You get indignant about what others do wrong and you smooth over what you did. I'm talking to me. Now, turn to Titus chapter 2. Give you rules for the church, and I got one more place to close in, okay?
Titus chapter 2. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Titus chapter 2. Verse 1. These are commandments to church people. Everybody in this church fits in one of these compartments here. We have old, aged men, aged women, young men and young women. Titus chapter 2 gives us all commandments on how to treat one another. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity. And... Ugh, my wife is right. She says to me that the older I get, the more intemperate I'm getting. I'm turning into cranky old man. And she's sitting at home going. I am. I am. And I don't like it. Now, he's not, old, us, us elder men, he's not telling us, now just forget about doctrine because that's not important. He's not telling us that. It is important. What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. Amen? But that doesn't mean we can't love people that are wrong. The aged men are supposed to be that way. In patience. Verse 3, the aged women likewise. Aged women are also supposed to be the same way. In charity and in patience. That they be in behavior as becoming holiness. Not false accusers. So let me ask you a question. There's two boxes here. One is love, charity, and one is hate. Where does gossip fall in? What box does it go in? Hate. Gossip. That's false accusers. But they did it! Doesn't matter. I've been the pastor of this church for years. People have told me things that they have done while they have been attending this church. Were I to run them out? Were I to castigate them? Were I to embarrass them publicly with what I know would be wrong? And I certainly wouldn't want you doing it to me. That's why God didn't make me all that holy and clean. Because if I start looking at everybody with what I know. Are you getting nervous? And then you'd have a right to look at me. Verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. No wonder we got empty pews and churches all over the place. Word of God gets blasphemed by church people. Now, 1 Peter 4, and then I'll be done. 1 Peter 4, and we'll leave you with this one. 1 Peter 4. Hey, turn your Bible there. Come on. I'm turn the screen off. 1 Peter 4. Well, now I don't remember what verse it was. Verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. How many of y'all believe that? Say amen. Yep. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now verse 8. Above all things. Hey, this is above everything that this church stands for. We believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Amen. It's holy and it's right. It's perfect. has no error in it whatsoever. And if we're not careful, we'll let that puff us up. Because I know a bunch of churches that believe the same thing that I wouldn't give a dime for them. Because that's all they're about, being right. Winning every argument, being right about everything. 
Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Among yourselves, he said. Look at, verse, look at the rest of the verse. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You think about that. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. Raise your hand if you qualify under the clause and abundance of sins. Thank you. Now stand up and tell me them. No. So, shouldn't we treat sinners the way God has treated us? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we forgive, even if they don't ask? Maybe they will. And then that will cause us then to do a lot of things for people who we would say don't deserve to have it done to them. That cop that killed that guy Deserves to go to prison. But what I've, what I, here's what I've seen. I've seen people who've had somebody in their family murdered. And then go to court and look in the eye of the murderer and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Which do you think will change the heart and the mind of a murderer? The vengeance of the law, which they deserve, or the love of the people that he hurt, which will change a man. What will break him down more than anything? Charity, forgiveness, love. Because then you understand that what he did really is no worse than the things you did and the people that you hurt. And there's two ways of looking at this verse. Number one, your charity toward others will cover the multitude of your sins. I believe that. But then, here's the other way of looking at it. Your charity is covering the multitude of other people's sins. Now, is that right? Think about what Jesus did for us. Was it his wrath upon us that changed us? Was it his intemperance? Or was it his mercy that changed our lives? His mercy, Gary. His mercy. There are sins that just about every day I go back to God and ask Him to forgive. And those were years ago. I never get over what I've done wrong. And everything that I do for somebody in their life is me hoping that my sins also are covered. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we, say it with me, as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what our Savior told us to pray. Charity co covered the multitude of sins. Don't ever forget that. Put that in your mind. Recite it back to yourself every day. Charity covereth the multitude of sins. Charity covereth the multitude of sins. Charity covereth the multitude of sins.